thank you, uh, Ashraf, for this presentation. And I would like to thank Professor Hassan Ali uh, and uh, welcome uh, my uh, uh, dear friend, uh, Botros Riz and uh, Abu Bakr Nashar. Uh, and I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee. Hi, yani, Raghda, Taraf Talim, we've been to the Fatu, Raghda, Inji, Akram, Musamah, Mahabz Al Qab, Yani. They've done a very good job. So uh, my uh, talk today, uh, yes, uh, about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, it won't be a conventional uh, talk. I'm not going to talk uh, in a conventional uh, manner uh, because I'm sure you have uh, quite good knowledge of uh, uh, the uh, topic. I'm going to give the tips and tricks for uh, the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome pointing certain important uh, aspects uh, about the incidence of OHSS according to this uh, uh, European study. The mild forms of OHSS, which most of us meet in our practice, comprise about 33% uh, of patients undergoing IVF. Those who go to moderate to uh, severe OHSS, about 10% of this value, uh, and we do see quite a good bunch of these uh, patients. Uh, and 10% of these uh, goes into the critical form of HSS that need hospitalization and may need ICU admission. And three in 100,000 uh, of uh, the patients, unfortunately, uh, may uh, die. What's the etiology of OHSS? Uh, Although HSS is famous to be uh, iatrogenic, however, it's reported in the literature that OHSS may happen spontaneously uh, in a singleton pregnancy uh, and in multiple pregnancy, cases with hydatiform uh, mole. And the tip here is patients with hypothyroidism, and these patients are uh, uh, liable for spontaneous uh, OHSS. Uh, as for the iatrogenic part, the tip here is that the uh, main theme for the uh, OHSS may be unpredictable. Uh, it just falls on our heads under the uh, uh, umbrella of over-response. الاستجابة المفرطة وليس التنشيط الزائد. الاستجابة المفرطة. Over response. And this is unpredictable. We cannot measure it, cannot anticipate it before we start our stimulation cycle. But what's in our hand is overstimulation. To give excessive GnRH, uh, to give the excessive gonadotropins for the patient. So this is in our hands. The other thing that's in our hands is the trigger with HCG, which starts the whole cascade of the problem. Uh, the tip here is you can have uh, OHSS even when you use clomiphene citrate, and this has been recorded in the literature, but of course, the classic teaching is that in patients uh, undergoing IVF, the PCO patients, uh, when you use the long protocol, you are asking for trouble. And this has been published by my dear friend Botros Rez back in 1992. Uh, Botros has published a lot of publications and uh, has uh, books related to this topic of hyperstimulation, either with uh, other colleagues or with my dear professor uh, Mohammed Abulghar. Uh, who has classified, together with uh, Dr. Agat Mansour, the time classification of OHSS and starting from 24 uh, hours after the OPU up to the first seven days. And this is due to the exogenous HCG that we give and characteristic of these patients is they have excessive ovarian response. And most of these patients are mild, although some of them may go to the severe forms of HSS. But if our patients become pregnant, they will express uh, late OHSS, 10 to 15 days later. Uh, and these patients may not have the excessive classic 
uh, ovarian response that we are acquainted with. And unfortunately, these patients go to severe or uh, critical. So Golan uh, uh, et al. Uh, back in 1989 and later on has uh, subclassified ovarian hyperstimulation into degrees to grade one OHSS, which is together with grade two, most of our cases that we see, including abdominal bloating, mild abdominal pain, uh, moderate uh, uh, pain, uh, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, together, they are included under the umbrella of the mild OHSS. And in these cases, you find ovarian size usually less than eight centimeters. Uh, but if you go upscale to the moderate OHSS, you find that grade three, you find, you find ultrasound evidence of ascites. But if you find clinical evidence of ascites, you are running to grade four together with breathing difficulties and you can see the ovaries growing to 12 centimeters. Uh, if you have hemoconcentration and excessive tight, uh, tense clinical ascites together with uh, uh, hydrothorax, now you're running for the grade five and this is the severe OHSS, especially if you have uh, compromised uh, uh, oliguria, hematocrit value more than 45, hyponatremia, hypoosmolarity, hyperkalemia, that's all under uh, electrolyte imbalance, uh, ovarian size growing more than 12 centimeters. Now you have the severe form of OHSS. And now uh, recently Golan ex uh, the explained uh, or showed the grade six uh, OHSS, including the uh, tense hydrothorax, hematocrit more than 55, leucocytic count more than 25,000, oliguria or even anuria, uh, and renal failure, thromboembolic uh, accidents together with uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. I'm going to stop here to tell you about a story, about this interesting uh, uh, character, the Japanese Admiral uh, Isoroku uh, Yomamatu. He was the uh, designer and he was the uh, uh, manager for the Pearl Harbor uh, attack back in December uh, 7th, 1941 on the U.S. fleet in uh, Hawaii. Uh, more than 200 uh, aircrafts attacked, as you all know. And uh, after the second wave of the uh, attack, all the generals knew that it was a smashing victory and they rejoiced except for this wise uh, admiral who said, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant. And this phrase became famous for several instances apart from the Navy. And in OHSS, who do you think is the sleeping giant? It is the big V, the vascular endothelial growth factor. And from now on, I'm going to call it the V. So this is the initiator of all the uh, storm and the cascade of the uh, uh, syndrome of OHSS. It is the primary mediator. And the denominator of severity, the higher the uh, V, the more severe the OHSS. Uh, it had characterized by increased capillary permeability, and you can see from its name, it's vascular endothelial growth factor. So one of the uh, publications uh, described the uh, 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 new vascularization into a fenestrated vessel. Fenestrated meaning it allows the leakage of the intravascular proteins to the third space and accumulating uh, fluid in the third space away from the intravascular compartment, causing ascites pleural effusion and pericardial uh, effusion. Together with uh, another mediator storms, whether working directly or indirectly as secondary mediators to complete the big picture of the severe OHSS syndrome. But who started the volcano? HCG is the trigger for this storm of the V. It helps uh, the gene expression of the uh, uh, V 
V from the human granulosa cells. It acts in another way. Uh, it releases the vasoactive uh, angiogenic substances uh, from the hyperstimulated ovary primed by the gonadotrophins. So our aim here is to prevent OHSS. The plan of action for preventing OHSS will start by predicting the cases that who are going to develop OHSS. We're going to call them the high-risk group, and they start by the design and the decision for you before you start the stimulation. The patients with PCOS, women with history of OHSS, whether mild, moderate, or severe, uh, the choice of the long agonist protocol, antrophoricular count more than 50, the AMH more than 3.3, and even if you have started the stimulation, you notice that 15 to 25 follicles are growing simultaneously in both ovaries, measuring more than 10 millimeters in early follicular phase. The E2 level is storming high, reaching as high as 3,500 rapidly. So now you see the red light that you're going to develop OHSS. So how do you prevent this racing car? Uh, you can give small doses of gonadotrophins and step up simultaneously to a soft or mild stimulation, or even withhold the gonadotropins, uh, uh, what that we call coasting, uh, or use the antagonist protocol and agonist trigger or you choose to do elective cryopreservation preservation of the embryos and do not do embryo transfer to prevent late OHSS, or you can cancel the cycle altogether. So the mild stimulation, you start with the low dose, the 75 units, uh, incrementing by 37.5 every few days. Take your time, monitor response closely, and trigger when the follicle reaches 17 millimeters. Uh, unfortunately, by the evidence, recent evidence, this is not now a popular way because you get very few uh, follicles very late and uh, may not be uh, reflected on the pregnancy date. Um, in hyper-responder uh, women, mild stimulation has not achieved the wide acceptance, uh, especially in the presence and the availability of the antagonist agonist trigger. Uh, protocol and freezing, so uh, uh, now it's not in uh, use. Or you can do coasting, and I've been lucky enough to start these trials and publications by Professor Abovar with uh, Botros Riz, uh, to start uh, uh, the coasting when you have follicles growing more than 20 in both ovaries and the leading ones leaching up to 14 to 16 millimeters, you start by starving the V, start, starving the vascular endothelial growth factor by uh, uh, stopping the battery charging from the uh, uh, gradotropins you're giving. Uh, and so uh, the smaller follicles go to atrophy and you have only the dominant follicles growing. Uh, and you, uh, you start as well when you find the rising uh, E2. Uh, you usually, usually extend the coasting only for one or two days because if you extend more than that, you're going to compromise the pregnancy rate. And this very tricky coasting thing, uh, you find that you lose your uh, momentum of uh, stimulation very rapidly and uh, you end up in uh, uh, dropping levels of the E2 uh, when this is associated with poor oocyte yield. Uh, given also that the embryologists uh, start to complain that they can't see the cumulus offers or difficult identification of the oocyte. So currently as well, coasting is not popular any, anymore as a way to curb the OHSS. Um, of course, the GNR antagonist protocol is now in vogue and it's now almost as we heard from uh, uh, Professor Robert Norman, is the norm now uh, in cases for uh, uh, predicted to develop OHSS to give her the uh, GNRH antagonist uh, protocol uh, as a standard. Uh, the option, the other option is to give the agonist trigger. You have the option to use one, two, three ampoules, four ampoules, uh, different according to the publications. Well, like this one, uh, uh, published in May 2020, uh, uh, and 
uh, has the advantage, the, uh, the agonist uh, trigger, uh, than the HCG because it is short-lived. The HCG has a long half-life. In addition, that the uh, agonist has a flare-up effect, both for FSH and LH. The HCG has only an LH effect. Uh, the more important thing is the uh, uh, agonist trigger displaces the antagonist from the receptors, so promises you very adequate luteal phase. Uh, the last, uh, the one before last is elective cryopreservation of the embryos. Um, and of course, uh, all of you are acquainted. It eliminates the late onset OHSS and you can use it both with the agonist and the antagonist uh, protocol. As a last resort, you can cancel the cycle, but mind you that uh, it is the definite, the only definite method to prevent uh, severe OHSS uh, and critical OHSS, but it has high financial loss for the patient. She spent a lot of money, uh, she's uh, under psychological stress, and deeply frustrating, and I'm intended to use an extra E here because it is deeply frustrating. And believe me, the patient will blame you, will come after you for uh, what happened to her. So this will only be used as a last resort in certain cases with history of being admitted to ICU in previous cycles with OHSS. What about the established cases? I'm going to run rapidly in that. Most of our patients go on the outpatient uh, platforms, uh, whether mild or selected cases of moderate. You uh, encourage the patient at home to have oral fluids for correction of hemoconcentration. You follow up the patient preferably every day and ask her to visit every uh, week. Um, however, if she cannot maintain uh, oral uh, fluids because of nausea and vomiting, uh, you can start her on uh, normal saline uh, IV infusion. But if she still doesn't respond to this with adequate renal function, you have to admit her to give her intravenous colloids, whether albumin or uh, hydroxyethyl uh, starch. Um, but mind you, if you're still going to start this, I prefer that you have uh, an anesthetist or ICU specialist by your side. I'm going to go, not going to go through uh, details for the albumin and the HES, but albumin is no longer as well in vogue now uh, because being a biological material with all the risk factors for HIV, hepatitis B and C. Uh, and its uh, uh, evidence uh, failed to prove that it's effective in preventing severe OHSS. Uh, HES is more promising. It decreases the incidence of severe FS, uh, OHSS. It's cheaper and safer. Uh, you can use cabergoline, but mind you, uh, cabergoline is, will not help you in established OHSS, OHSS. So you better use cabergoline as a uh, uh, protection uh, and start it before the day of ACG. This is where you get really get the benefits uh, from uh, uh, Kabergolin, as published by uh, our Cairo University colleague, Ahmed Abfattah uh, Youssef. Metformin, um, uh, it's a very useful medication, as we heard from Professor Norman, as we all use it. It reduces the V factor, and you can give doses up to two, one to two grams per day. Uh, but it's preferable to start before your cycle with two to three months. And it's uh, effective in reducing OHSS by 63% as per our colleague in Cairo University as well, uh, Yahya Faisal. Uh, letrozole had been used and it's been uh, uh, used in uh, many cycles uh, in our uh, practice. You can use it as an addition to the GN uh, uh, antagonist uh, protocol. Uh, what about the thrombosis? This is the Baba of uh, OHSS. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a venous uh, thrombosis. It's an arterial clot. Uh, strange enough, it chooses to uh, uh, affect the upper part of the body, the brain, the cerebral arteries, causing hemiplegia and sometimes uh, death. So please mind the thrombosis complication of OHSS. 
these patients, give them, um, let them wear stockings and give them low molecular weight. The point and the tip here is you can find this thrombotic threat several weeks after the improvement of the OHSS. The neurological symptoms may present late, even during pregnancy. As regards the invasive therapy, paracentesis. And the paracentesis, the tip here is preserve it for tense uh, ascites and patients with perfusion, problems with the kidneys, uh, and complaining of shortness of uh, breath. Uh, my last few slides will only point to when do you really need uh, surgeries. Uh, this is very rare to be needed in case of variant torture, rupture, or rupt, or breaking of the uh, ovaries, ectopic pregnancy. So as a conclusion, and if you don't mind my bad drawings, uh, you can see here that uh, the uh, upper part is the unpredictable uh, part, which is the ovarian response. You on the left side in red, and the patient, especially the PCO patient, so if you're lucky enough and you get this triad uh, at bay, you will not get to HSS. But if the patient starts to float inside the unpredictable uh, uh, and uh, get uh, excess ovarian response, you are going to get ovarian hyperstimulation. If you are not concentrating in selecting your patients and predicting the uh, uh, ovarian uh, response outcome, uh, you are going to get uh, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation. And at the end, if all of them triad meet together, you're going to face a big ovarian hyperstimulation. So, ladies and gentlemen, my last slide here is our aim. Our aim is to have a successful cycle of ART uh, in achieving pregnancy with a singleton, lifetime birth, healthy baby, safely with no HSS. And thank you very much. First, I, I, I enjoyed the material, I enjoyed the presentation, and I enjoyed the experience. Thank you very much, Hassan. Really, 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 no, 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 very much. this is true. Can, can you please, because you, you've been in the factory, you've been in the center which has most of the cycles during the early beginning in Egypt. Uh, uh, what about aspiration of acidic fluid in established cases? How, how frequent does this have to be done? What about the role of calcium gluconate? And what about the role of estrogen in stimulation or, or induction of VEGF uh, gene expression? Estrogen. Uh, as regards the first question about the paracentesis, uh, we have worked a lot about this paracentesis. Uh, uh, we, uh, we reserved this for the severe cases. Uh, we were the first to start the autotransfusion of the aspirated acetic fluid after filtration. Uh, this uh, did not uh, prove uh, superior to the colloids at that time. Uh, and uh, it's no longer popular now, although there are some recent studies uh, in um, 2016 uh, has, uh, from Austria has revisited the aspiration and filtration and re-injection uh, to correct the hypoosmolarity uh, of the OHSS patients, especially with uh, hyponatremia and so uh, Your second question. Calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate IV, uh, you put it on 200 milliliters, give it as an infusion. And there are several studies in that proving it is effective. And uh, one of studies as well by uh, Amla Fatah Yusuf and uh, Ismail Abu here in Egypt uh, have worked on it. And it quite uh, seemed to be uh, uh, promising. If you gather more than 15 oocytes, you might as well. But the point here or the tip here is to give it very slowly. Give the calcium gluconate very slowly infusion uh, IV. Uh, as uh, regards the uh, last question about the E2, what was the question? What, what is the effect of estrogen on VEGF gene expression? Is it important? Estrogen, you, you explained HCG, but is yes. estrogen important in this equation? Uh, yes, it is. It is important in expression uh, of the gene in these cases and maybe the promoter for the storm that happens 
together uh, with uh, these uh, cases and it's uh, associated with unfortunate symmetry and critical load chances. Ashraf, please. Thank you, Abdel Megid. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Abdel Megid. I have a few questions from the audience. I think one about the uh, dosage and duration of cabergoline in OHSS prevention. Uh, uh, well, uh, cabergoline, you use uh, one tablet per day for uh, eight days and you start uh, the day before or even few days before uh, the HCG injection when you start to be uh, alerted on the response of uh, the uh, patients. As I said, it is good for uh, uh, curbing the power of the OHSS, but it's no good if you have established OHSS. Okay, the second one about the metformin, uh, and uh, uh, the audience suggested that uh, use of metformin is okay, uh, you mean in the non-antagonist uh, cycles? Uh, because I think there is a reporting a report in the new guidelines between uh, the use of metformin and the antagonist of the core. What's your suggestion? Metformin usually, if you started earlier two to three months before uh, the cycle, in PCO, hyperandrogenic uh, obese uh, women, uh, uh, may be useful in the uh, lowering the rate of uh, OHSS. Whether it is agonist or, or antagonist, of call, because I think the new guidelines recommended not to use uh, it in the antagonist protocol. Uh, the guidelines for the concomitant use of metformin in the antagonist protocol. Yes, not but before. if you use it before two to three months before your cycle, and especially together with uh, weight limiting uh, lifestyle changes, uh, it definitely it is uh, more effective. Yes, I think there, uh, there are some reports that it is not effective uh, except if it is used more than eight weeks, like Professor Al Yes, yes, yes. Any suggestions from? And uh, as Professor Norman, Norman from, said, Professor Norman even mentioned that, that even if you use it as a sole agent long enough, it is quite effective in treating PCOS patients yes. without stimulation. Any suggestion about that from uh, Dr. Bakr, Dr. Hassan Shreef, about the use of uh, metformin and uh, cabergolin? Any other opinion? I am a yes, uh, I am a metformin, about this is one. The uh, metformin uh, to prevent the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in antagonist protocol, it is not recommended. And the, it was found also that it will decrease the clinical pregnancy rate. Yes. Dr. Hassan? Contradiction. <laughs> okay. not, not contradiction because metformin. No, 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 for me. It, uh, no, no I'm, see, I'm speaking about me. For um, me, Metformin is effective in decreasing the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation. Yes. Uh, as Abdemid said, if you use it for two months before the stimulation cycle. And uh, okay. okay. Uh, and I think uh, Professor, I think Professor Sharif also has uh, can have a comment on capergolin because he had a study on capergolin. Yes. Uh, we we had a study, uh, Professor Hassan and myself, we had a study that was uh, published uh, in the ASRM a couple of years, a few years actually ago, uh, regarding the early usage, the early start of capergolin. By that time, most of the people started capergolin on the day of HCG, but we started it uh, when the leading follicle is 15 millimeters, yes. and actually yes. it led to a better outcome. And uh, sure. I think that from the community of the people working in the IVF field, I was glad that uh, Professor Ramsey said that he's using it earlier than the day of HCG because uh, from the uh, molecular level, it inhibits the VEGF and its expression starts before administrating the uh, HCG. So it's better to be used earlier around maximum size of the follicle 15 millimeters. Yes, Professor Sharif, uh, you know, but you know that cabergolin prevents the phosphorylation of the uh, vascular endothelial factor, growth factor. So if you wait till the day of HCG, the storm already started. Yes, but that's if you started why we... earlier, yes, if you started earlier enough, you will yes. 
covered and, they, and, 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 and we presented this data in 2014 i think uh, we presented that the earlier the start the better the outcome the better the outcome sure yes yes sure yes to and I professor think hassan's professor idea to and we presented the work I think there were uh, some work like that in Al Asraini by Dr. Hisham Al Anani, maybe uh, since four or five years. Yes, yes. I think so. uh, this is true. But I think Professor Anani started it from the start of, of, from of the start the of, the of the cycle. Yes, yes. The start of the from cycle. The start of the cycle. Yes. The yes. Uh, but for so, the uh, for the audience, the general consensus is uh, started uh, uh, when the red light is on. When you find that you are running on for OHSS, you start it immediately without hesitation, a few days before the HCG. Yes, usually a couple of days or three days. Yes. Okay, uh, OHSS happens in patient with a single ovary. Uh, what is the cause? And she wants to do another IVF cycle. This is another question from Dr. Ines Mahmoud uh, about a patient with single ovary and uh, she has the ovarian habit simulation. What she can do again. If this, if, if this is her only ovary, yes, she, she may develop OHSS. No problem about that. So uh, the treatment will be as established cases of OHSS with all its degrees, whether moderate or severe. Okay. Uh, Professor Abdel Megid, um, another question from me. You have any limit uh, for uh, the estradiol limit uh, when you are stimulating a patient? You uh, should uh, freeze all and uh, and do uh, and cancel the cycle uh, and not trigger with SCG? Do you have any limit? And if you decide to uh, trigger with the agonist trigger, uh, you have any limit for estradiol level or you can trigger with agonist whatsoever the estradiol is? You mean trigger with agonist in an antagonist cycle? I don't measure the... I mean two the... questions. The first one about the cutoff limit of E2 that you direct the patient for freeze all in general. And the second question about uh, the cutoff limit in uh, agonist trigger cycle. Do you have any cutoff limit for estrogen or you don't measure it whatsoever? Well, uh, for the first question, I'm sort of liberal in the freeze all, uh, Professor Asha. If I find the patient uh, uh, running for OHSS, I always put the option uh, for freezing because our patients are suspicious. Uh, when you go into the uh, OPU stage, and then say, I'm going to freeze, they start to be suspicious about the outcome of the cycle. But if you counsel the patient as you've had uh, E2 levels 3,500 or more, uh, you uh, counsel the patient that probably I'm going to freeze all the uh, uh, oocytes, this is better. Okay, and for the agorist trigger, you don't have any uh, cutoff limit of estradiol? For the, uh, for the agonist uh, trigger, well, uh, it, of course, it's better to have uh, the not shooting high uh, levels of uh, E2, but as long as you're going to use the agonist trigger and uh, freeze all, you are safe. Any other comment from the uh, professors, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Bakr, Dr. Sharif? No comment. Okay, uh, half, life, half life duration of agonist and SCG in triggering. I think this question about the risk of hyperstimulation. Differentiation yes, between half life. The uh, SCG is uh, much uh, longer. The, uh, uh, the agonist is about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, the SCG may reach up to 45 days. So it's much longer half life. 